Today we're going to be going over one of the greatest action movies of all time, John Wick 4, directed by Chad Stahelski and filmed by Mr. Dan Lawson. We're going to have a lot of fun with this video and if you are a film aficionado like I am or an aspiring filmmaker or cinematographer, here are some basic tips and observations that I've made from watching this movie that I wanted to share with you guys that could probably help you out with your own projects as well. This is an observation video about the cinematography behind John Wick 4. So without further ado, here we go. We're gonna get this bad boy started by shining a spotlight on the movie's DP, Dan Lawson. He is a Robert Award winning cinematographer. It's basically the Danish equivalent of the Oscars. In regards to notable work, he was the lead cinematographer for Guillermo del Toro's movie, Shape of Water. Shape of Water was so beautiful that it actually won Best Picture for the Academy Awards in 2017. And it's one of my girlfriend's personal favorite movies to watch. Aside from that, Dan's also been the DP for Crimson Peak and one of my personal favorite movies, Silent Hill with Sean Bean. Also on a side note, Dan Lawson has been in the cinematography industry for over 40 years and it is only after 40 years where he becomes the lead cinematographer for John Wick 4. So I say that to tell you guys this, stay in it, keep pushing, and if you don't stop, you will get there. Dan Lawson started as a film student in 1976 and this wasn't even his first career choice. So chase your dream, guys. Okay, so let's talk about equipment. What equipment was used to film John Wick 4? I'm not a very technical cinematographer, you know. I'm, I like to have, you know, when it works, it doesn't work. And for me, I want to have some equipment that I can trust 100% and it's, it's the same all the time, and then I'm working around that. In the earlier movies, specifically Chapter 2 and Chapter 3, they filmed it with a Super 35 millimeter sensor camera. But for this specific movie, Chad Stahelski, the director, wanted to film everything wider because he wanted to showcase the grandiosity of all of the scenes in addition to how big these uh, fight sequences were, which included several actors. Actually, one of the scenes contained over 200 extras and 35 stunt performers. So in order to capture all of this, the cinematographer opted to use the LF or large format sensor, specifically using Ari's Alexa LF. Now you might be wondering, what is the difference between a super 35 millimeter sensor camera and a large format sensor camera? Think of the camera's field of view as a box in which the actors can perform in. If you can increase that box size, it allows the performers a little more levity and room to perform their choreography. Because the sensor size is larger in the LF, it actually provides a wider scope of view when using the same lens. In addition to that, LF sensor cameras are characteristic for having more detail in the shadows, producing a more three-dimensional image. And you're gonna have higher resolution that comes with having a larger sensor. A little side note, Ari is one of the top producers for cinema grade cameras. And the camera that was used for this specific film, the Ari Alexa LF, actually starts its retailing at $98,200. Fuck off. So essentially, if you are not already an established director or cinematographer, you're not gonna get your hands on this camera unless you're Christopher Nolan's son. In fact, most DPs rent this equipment out themselves when they're going out to film, they don't own it because it's that expensive. But that's totally okay, and let me tell you why. Equipment doesn't make the cinematographer. The cinematographer's knowledge and mastery of lighting and framing make the cinematographer. For example, I am using a Sony a7S III, which retails at $3,500, and I have been using that for the past couple of years, but if you look at my previous YouTube videos, which I shot with that camera, they didn't look as good as they do now, simply because I developed my understanding of lighting and framing. Now I have a key light in front of me and I have a backlight and this helps me to create a more three-dimensional figure, which is better to look at. As Dan Lawson says, equipment is just here to help us tell the story. So it's better to start off with cheaper equipment and work your way up than buying top of the line equipment. The lenses of choice for this movie came from Ari's Alpha Anamorphic lineup. I'm shooting Master Primes or Master Anamorphics all the time, and I'm always shooting, if I can't, 3.5, you know, split between 2.8 and 4. 
because I think that's the depth of field I like. Anamorphic lenses are characteristic for a couple of different things. First off, the bokeh or the blurriness you see in the back have this unique stretched out appearance. Strong light sources tend to have flares when filmed with an anamorphic lens. For example, if you take a look at Star Trek, you're gonna see hundreds of flares in that movie and that comes from filming light sources with an anamorphic lens. Additionally, anamorphic lenses have a wider aspect ratio, which helps with shooting wider scenes. So this also synergizes with using a larger sensor format on the camera. These type of lenses also increase the depth of the shadows inside the image, allowing you to have this really high contrast product that we see in John Wick 4. One last thing to mention, these are prime lenses. And what that means is that whatever lens you place onto the camera, you are stuck at that specific focal length. You can't change the lens around. That's the negative. The pro though is that at that specific focal length, you get stellar video quality. <laughs> Which brings us along to the next section of the video, the method of filming for John Wick 4. So you might be wondering, how many cameras were they using to film the fight sequences? For the majority of the movie, only two cameras were being operated for each scene, including all of the complex fight sequences. As opposed to using handheld, most of Dan's work was conducted using an MKV AR Steadicam. And that's how he was able to produce all of these smooth movements during the fighting sequences. Between the two cameras, one of them was attached to a wide lens to capture the full scale of what was going on in the scene. And the other camera had a lens at a longer focal length to punch in and capture the details of the shot. The cinematography team also utilized several other forms of equipment in order to capture all of the crazy scenes that we see in the movie, including the technocrane, drones, spider cams, cable cams, wire cams, all of that crap. Also, hundreds of lights of various types were utilized to light up all of the scenes, including the backgrounds and the characters. Now that we've briefly talked about the equipment and the methods in which the crew used to film this movie, I'm gonna share with you guys some of the observations I made while watching this movie. This is the cinematic breakdown portion of this video. Now let me restate. A lot of these observations are very fundamental techniques that most filmmakers know, but that's okay because despite these being basic techniques, they are actually still hard to pull off in practice and they are very important to keep in mind when filming your own project. So let's go over these together and help us have a refresher and improve on our craft. Let's talk about shoot composition. Dan loves to film in wide angles. This allowed him to showcase the grandiosity of all of the film locations and also to help showcase the sprawling and really drawn out fight sequences of which there are over 14 in this movie. Filming in a wide angle is actually really unconventional and is a stark contrast to how fight sequences are filmed in many other action movies. Let's take a look at the Bourne Ultimatum series starring Matt Damon or the Taken series with Liam Neeson. These movies are shot with a gritty gorilla style that is very characteristic of handheld. sequences are cut super quickly so you feel like there's a stuttering strobing effect going on that can be a little bit overwhelming and you are left with not really knowing what character did what action. Conversely, the fight scenes in John Wick 4 were filmed with smooth movements and were more long and drawn out, overall elevating the experience and fluidity for the viewers.
Filming these fight sequences in one long drawn out shot is actually much more difficult to execute because it requires the performers to be on top of their fight choreography and blocking. The performance of the fight choreographers in John Wick 4 was nothing short of amazing. In fact, they were so good that the cinematographer was worried about nailing the shots in as few takes as possible because the stunt performers, including Keanu Reeves, who has over 30 years of combat experience, would nail the shots down in almost like one take. Another observation I made was the camera movements would follow the characters and the characters themselves would progress the shot. What this does from a storytelling perspective is it places the audience in the point of view of the character that's in focus. Next up in shooting composition, let's talk about eyeline continuity. I'm gonna throw a line on one specific point of the screen and notice how your eyeline is continuously directed to this specific location. Eyeline continuity is a fundamental filming technique in which the director and editor direct the attention of the viewer's eye to a specific location on the screen despite the scenes changing. This really helps to create a seamless and natural flow of visual information for the audience, making it easier for them to follow the action and understand the spatial relationships between the characters and objects in the scene. Okay, so there are two types of eyeline continuity that we're gonna discuss in this video. The first is the audience's eyeline continuity and the second is the actor's eyeline continuity. The audience's eyeline continuity refers to the location on the screen in which the director is directing the audience's point of view. Let's talk about the actor's eyeline continuity. This pertains to how actors are directed to look at a specific location while on scene to make sure that the eyeline continuity of each character is consistent. So if one person is looking at a specific direction, the next scene should showcase what they're looking at. In this clip, notice how Winston is looking down at an object. The next scene showcases a downward angle of the hourglass that is emptying. This is an example of eyeline continuity. One more fundamental technique I wanna broach up upon is the over the shoulder technique. You see this all the time in conversations. In an OTS shot, the camera first showcases one person's perspective while he's talking, typically over the shoulder. The next scene flips to showcase the other person's perspective. This is another fundamental technique that is used to showcase the spatial relationship between two people having a conversation. Akira. Please tell my daughter that I look forward to our dinner. The next section we're gonna talk about is my personal favorite, the lighting. John Wick 4 has spectacular scenes that showcases so many cool places that I really wanna to go to with my girlfriend in the future. In order to fully realize these scenes, the cinematography crew spent days pre-lighting the set. The background of each scene was well lit and had very defined outlines. Dan Lawson's high contrast lighting technique is very resemblant of the chiaroscuro painting technique that you see in a lot of Renaissance paintings. Chiaroscuro is a technique in which you contrast heavy shadows and bright highlights together to create a more three-dimensional image. For example, if you take a look at this subject right here where one side of the subject is white and the other side is black, if you place that on a background and you flip the background colors, you're gonna notice that the subject of focus really pops out on screen. And this is kind of how every scene in John Wick 4 looks. When you take into consideration how enormous some of these scenes are and how many actors are performing at any given time on the set, the lighting setup that went into each scene was super complex to say the least. Due to the fast moving action and to allow the performers space and flexibility, the light fixtures had to be placed far away and not on the floor. To throw another wrench into the mix, the lighting that you see on screen isn't necessarily the lighting that the actors were seeing during production. So Dan had to focus on creating practical lighting for the actors to be able to see their movements while on screen. So mixing the two was a really difficult endeavor, but he pulled it off. 
Since the movie was largely filmed at night, all of the light fixtures had to be quickly dimmable so that they can adjust the exposure while the characters were moving. The cinematographer crew utilized several LED fixtures for the fast moving shots and for the more established shots for scenes that they would stay within the pocket for, they would use these huge lights, T12 and T24 dyno lights. Let's talk about character lighting. John Wick 4 is known for creating dramatic lighting. To pull this off, Dan Lawson was a huge fan of single source split lighting on the characters. If you notice in each of these scenes, one side of the character's face is completely lit up and the other side is dark. I'm afraid you've come a very long way for nothing. You came close. Too bad. Too close. You put her in danger. Where this ends, the table will never stop. You know this. Unlike conventional filming techniques in which there's a key light and also a fill light, the crew was able to get away with a single source split lighting because the background of each scene had so much backlight that it would create a hairline on these characters, which allowed them to punch out from the background. I failed to see how laying waste the Continentals is getting you closer to killing John Wick. Now, if you look at my screen where I'm talking directly to you, you can notice some light in the back of my shirt, and that is the hairline. That allows me to pop out from the camera. Obviously, the way that they're doing it in the film is top of the line professional. Let's take a moment to appreciate the efforts behind the complex lighting design that we see during the nightclub fight scene between John Wick and Killa, a member of the high table. This specific set was unlike anything that Dan Lawson had previously worked on. This scene contained over 200 extras and 35 stunt doubles, requiring extensive pre-lighting for the over 400 meter long and 60 meter wide space that they used to film the scene. Nonetheless, there's actually one additional scene that raises the bar even further and is probably one of the most amazing technical light achievements that I've ever seen in cinema. And it's the sunrise shootout scene that you see at the end of the movie. All of the light that you see was artificially created. this scene was actually filmed at night. They recreated the freaking sunlight by amplifying a bunch of lights on the scene and then using VFX to add in the sunrise at the end. Here's a quote from Dan. We needed to shoot that night for day as the only way we could control the sunrise was by hanging many vortexes on a big rig above the church. We then used a large crane with four 16K dynos with full CTO on to create the sunrise as it was slowly lifted and then the visual effects team helped with the background. I'd never done anything like that before. I don't think many have. It was such a crazy idea. So how does the lighting affect the mood and atmosphere of the movie? Due to the high contrast nature that this movie was filmed in, it creates a very dramatic feel. Characters are lit with split lighting. Lighting is moved constantly, creating a sense of unease and tension. And this can especially be seen in the poker game scene inside Killa's lair, in which fans are quickly rotating on top of the scene and you can see quick movements of shadows creating higher tension. And I love that. It makes the action movie so much more elevated and it just has such a different look compared to other standard action films where everything looks conventionally lit. This is personal. I sense tension here. Chiaroscuro lighting is by far one of my favorite techniques due to the high contrast nature which produces innate dramatic qualities in paintings and movies. And I think Dan Lawson nailed that technique in this movie. Because everything is going, everything is pre-lit and you know, we, the way we are shooting right now is going so fast that so you have to be able to control everything by demos. Lawson wants the light to be part of the drama in a third dimension to the atmosphere of the scene. We are moving on to our final section of observation, color theory. Now, if you watch John Wick 4, one thing that makes it stand out is its hyper-realistic coloring. I think the problem is right now, everybody using the same kind of lights, so every movie is starting to look the same. While the second and third films were mostly shot in New York, 
The director Chad Stahelski wanted to expand the vision by finding suitable European cities. As a result, many of the shoots were conducted in Berlin and Paris, among other locations including Jordan, New York, and Japan. The cinematographers used the different color palettes to create a sense of world building. Each specific location had a unique color palette. For the Paris scenes, steel blue and 2800 degrees Kelvin tungsten were the primary colors. If you look at the Japan scenes, bright blues, pinks, reds, and greens were the primary colors. While color was often used as a stylistic choice, color theory was also used to help with the narrative of the story. Let's take a look at New York throughout the stages of the movie. Before the Continental was raised in the beginning of the movie, New York was cast in a twilight look as if dusk was setting. After the Continental was destroyed, all scenes in New York have a dead look. At the end of the movie, when Winston is restated as the hotel manager and the Continental is going to be reconstructed, New York looks alive again. The lead colorist for this film was Company 3's senior colorist, Jill Bogdanowicz, who also worked on Mike Flanagan's The Fall of House Usher and Todd Phillips' Joker. When coloring scenes filled with rapid action and fight sequences, Bogdanowicz generally pushes color and contrast further and uses secondaries to highlight specific elements in the frame more so than she would otherwise. Here's another quote from her. You want to make sure the audience really feels the movement and catches all the details when everything is going by so quickly. We'd use contrast and power windows to accentuate the shapes and details so we could help direct the viewer's eye so they don't miss a sword or a gun or some specific movement in a complex fight scene. Essentially, we're not just augmenting the color, we are using color to accentuate the choreography. Seeing all the variety and contrast of colors in John Wick Chapter 4 it's reminiscent of playing a hyper-realistic video game. As a viewer, you are plunged into a hyper-realistic world where everything is just that much brighter, that much darker, and that much more colorful. Let's wrap up this video. To the average viewer, I can easily understand why John Wick 4, as well as the rest of the movies in the franchise, can easily be brushed off as just another action movie series. But in reality, John Wick 4 is so much more. Due to all of the cinematic attributes that they intentionally put in, this is the sum of all of the great attributes that we enjoyed from the old kung fu movies we used to rent out from blockbusters, implemented with the amazing color design resembling some of the craziest video games that we can play today. The crew behind this movie really pushed themselves to the limit to create the spectacle for us. In fact, I really resonate with this quote from Dan. You must push yourself all the time, which we did through specialized and consistent color palette and trying to maintain a fill of constant momentum. I think you have to take some chances all the time because if you're not taking ch chances, you're not moving anywhere. If you just play the safe game all the time, it's, 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 you're not moving. And I think it's, if you're walking the thin red line, it's, it's um, of course sometimes dangerous, but you take some chances, you learn of that, and sometimes it's getting fantastic. So how do you get this good? How do you get to this point where you're this good at cinematography? I think it's very important you're true to yourself. You know, of course, you're going to get a lot of inspiration from painting, books, other movies, other cinematographers. And that's, I think that's really good to use that. But you cannot, you should not, you should try to make your own image and your own ideas about how to light and how to shoot. What Dan tells us is to push ourselves. We have to constantly push ourselves. Now, you might say this, Oh, the people of John Wick 4 had so much in their budget to be able to create whatever they wanted. That $100 million budget is divided amongst several departments, including the salary for the staff, the crew, and the cast members. Then you also have to set aside money for the marketing. Even so, Dan Lauston and his crew still ran into technical difficulties while trying to film certain scenes for the movie. 
For example, visiting multiple locations saw the filmmakers being forced to work within spaces with very confined restrictions. Many other setups required lengthy pre-lighting. The tunnel scene with the Bowery King required two kilometers of pre-lighting in the underground canal. The moral of the story is anything worth doing will take time and you will run into problems doing it, but you just get it done. Being persistent and being flexible to restrictions are hallmarks of being a good cinematographer. This wraps up my brief cinematic breakdown of John Wick 4. Thank you, Dan Lauston, for all that you've taught me during my brief research of your work. Thank you very much. And for the rest of you guys, I hope you've learned an interesting thing or two that can help improve your own cinematography or just help you appreciate the art of filmmaking a little bit more. I know it has for me. All right, guys, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. Peace. Thank you.